Well, good morning again, church. Thank you for joining us as we pick up in James chapter 2, as we continue our study in James. And last week when we started, uh, you know, James opens up with the idea of trials and maturity, that when you have a trial or, or something like that, that it has to run its course because maturity comes from, you know, the struggle and that God walks through it with us. And, and sort of a big key we hit last week as well was that we're not tempted by God. Right? God doesn't tempt anyone. We're tempted by our own selfish desires, our own selfish wants. Uh, but God gives us the opportunity to escape from that. And then we kind of ended last week with sort of similar thoughts to what we're going to end with this week, which is doing the things of the gospel. Right? It's not just enough to hear it. We have to do something. We're called to an action. And so we look this week in James chapter 2. It's a 2 Part It has two ideas here, but the first one is James chapter 2, starting at verse 1. It says, My brothers, hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ without showing favoritism. So this is one of those spots where it's when you look at James chapter 2, verse 1, it's a, you know what's coming next, right? And when you start off a, a chapter of scripture like this, without showing favoritism, we know what's been going on then, right? We know what's been happening. It's It's... Almost the equivalent as a parent when the kid comes in and you ask him up front, like, all right, you want to tell me what you did or you just want me to tell you what I know, right? And all of us have been there at one point or another as a kid, right? So you hearken back to when you're a child and the parent comes in and says, hey, do you just want to tell me or do you want me to tell you what I know? What is the thought that runs through your head in that moment, right? And as I look out among the faces here today, all of them are going, mm. Right? It's that, oh, I'm busted moment, right? Almost like when the, the officer walks up to the window and says, do you know why I pulled you over? Right? And the scene that instantly pops in my head from that, if, if you ever watch movies, is a Jim Carrey movie, right? Liar, liar. And the officer walks up, why'd you pull me over? It depends on how long you were following me. Right? And he proceeds to then air everything he's done in the course of driving that day because uh, he can't lie. And so as we look, and it's said here, without showing favoritism, so you can imagine when they open this letter and they get this comment of without showing favoritism, there might have been some uncomfortable shifting among the people in the room, right? And so it continues, for suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring dressed in fine clothes and a poor man dressed in dirty clothes also comes in. If you look with favor on the man wearing the fine clothes so that you say sit here in a good place, or some of yours may say in a place of honor, and yet you say to the poor man, stand over there or sit here on the floor by my footstool, which is where you would put the servants in case you're wondering. Haven't you discriminated among yourself and become judges with evil thoughts? What he's alluding to here is, is the church, unfortunately, was looking at this standpoint of, well, if somebody comes in that looks rich, we might be able to do what? Get money from them. Therefore, we want to treat them with all this honor and, and duty and respect so that maybe they give us some money. And when this poor person comes in and, and we don't feel like we can get anything out of them, then, well, you can be here, but, you know, just be out of the way, right? Be where nobody can notice you, right? Be, be, be somewhere where you're not a distraction. And so when we see this and it says you have become judges with evil thoughts, because their hearts were no longer on the soul of the person or the need of the gospel for the person, but it was on what the church could get from the person. Which when the church becomes about what it can get from people instead of what it's offering to people, it ceases to be a church and instantly becomes everybody's favorite thing, country club. When we begin to look at people as dollar signs or what they can offer to us, we're no longer a church. We deserve to be treated as such. My hope is that when we come into this place, that when anyone comes into this place, they're not judged based on what they look like or what clothes they have on. They're respected and honored as a person deserving of being treated well and told. I, you know, when anybody comes to the church for the first time, if I run into them, if I get to see them before they sit down, I always tell them, we don't do assigned seats around here. Go ahead and sit wherever you like. I know, Owen. It is difficult to be you sometimes, but they are not letting you have freedom, which is what you want. And so when we look at this, I remember when I was in church as a high school student and we had our youth section. And I remember the day that I chose to not sit in the youth section 
And I was flat told out by the deacons to get up and go back to where I belonged. That I was not where I was supposed to be. We think about that, and, and I talked to my, my youth minister, Lance, he caught me after that and, and you know, knew that shouldn't have happened, and, and later they apologized and, and this, that, and the other, but in my youth at the time, like I was flabbergasted by it, it, it bothered me, and Lance, he talked to these guys later, and he made it very clear to them, he said, what if that had been his first time here? And they said, well, he wasn't where the youth were supposed to be. And, and he told him, he said, well, if that had been his first time here, he'd have never sat there because we'd have never seen him again. And such a true statement there. That when we discriminate against people, even if, it, even if in our minds we don't think it's discrimination, right? Well, I don't mean it to be discrimination. It doesn't matter. When we don't treat people with the respect they're due as an image bearer of Christ, then we've discriminated. And so five continues. It says, listen, my dear brothers, didn't God choose the poor in this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? Yet you dishonored that poor man. So now we see here that this isn't a hypothetical situation. This is a what? This is real. This has happened. Don't the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Don't they blaspheme the noble name that you bear? And so we'll pause here for a minute. By no means is James speaking out against people, all people that are rich. What he's speaking out against here are people that are all about their money. This goes back to the idea of the love of money. When you are going after people just because of the money they have and not because they need to know Christ, then this is what happens. These people that are lovers of money will come into your church and they will very quickly tell you, well, because I have the money, I get to make all the decisions. And if you disagree with me, me and my money will leave. And what will you do then? And the church has to be careful not to fall into that trap. You know, it's, it's a dangerous precedent to fall into. And as people, we should never try to use any sort of monetary gain that we have to influence the ministry of the church. Because what does that say about us? Well, it says then that we respect and value our money over what God is doing. And it shows where our heart is. Verse 8 continues. It says, if you really carry out the royal law prescribed in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing well. But if you show favoritism, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgression, transgressors. And so we see there, love your neighbor as yourself. That verse that pops up pretty regularly. That verse that we like to read it and we like to say it to other people. But when it comes to our lives, we're fine with loving our neighbors as long as they do what? Stay on their side of the fence. Right? Wave at me. Keep your grass cut. We're good. But to truly love our neighbors as ourselves... To truly go out of our way to take care of our neighbor as we would take care of ourselves. But it says there, if we show favoritism, we commit sin. We're convicted by the law. Verse 10 continues, for whoever keeps the entire law yet fails in one point is guilty of breaking it all. For he who said do not commit adultery also said do not commit murder. So if you do not commit adultery but you do murder, you're a lawbreaker. So we see here, it's that this is the idea that we always want to reset the bar. This is what I talk about when I read this scripture is we don't want the bar to be Jesus in our human flesh because we can't win. But what we'll do in our humanity is we will change the bar, right? If we measure our lives against Jesus, then we understand that we lose. I can't be perfect. I can't be him. My goal as a Christian is to know that I'm never going to get there, but I should try as hard as I can to get there. And that as I work on getting there, I'm going to impact people for the gospel around me and see more come into the kingdom. But the world would tell us, well, you can't win. You can't hit that mark. So just measure yourself against your neighbor. Because you can beat that guy. Right? And the world, and if we're not careful, we very quickly fall into this trap that we might say, 
I mean, I'm not perfect, but I'm not who? I'm not the murderer, right? I'm not the parent of the kid in Georgia this week. And when we do that, we fail. We fail. When we lower the bar to that, we fail. Because we're guilty. And the problem is, when we realize that the bar is Jesus, we realize that we're guilty, and there's nothing that we in our humanistic capabilities can do about it. You can't pay the debt. You can't earn it. You can't do anything to justify yourself in your humanness. And so it totally becomes about the sacrifice of Christ over everything else. And in our humanness, we have to understand that, that we are all broken sinners. And the only way that we get forgiveness is through the sacrifice of a perfect and holy God who didn't have to do what he did, but did it anyway. Verse 12 continues, speak and act as those who will be judged by the law of freedom. That the law here is not the law of the Old Testament that we're judged by. It's the law of freedom, which is the law that comes through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. It's not enough to stand before him and go, I kept almost all of the law. Well, that's too bad. Because if you kept 613 out of 614, you're still guilty. And the punishment's the same whether you break one or you break them all. Verse 13, for judgment is without mercy to the one who hasn't shown mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. God's mercy triumphs over anything else. But we must also be merciful. We must also be willing to show mercy. We must also be willing to look at people as image bearers of Christ, as Joseph was alluding to with the kids, and understand that everyone needs to hear the gospel. It's not my job to look at someone and go, well, I'm not telling them the gospel because I think this and this about them. I'm not Jesus. My job is to look at them and go, hey, somebody loved you enough to die for you. He loved you enough to offer himself for you because there was no other way into heaven except through him. And what they do with that after that is on them. We talked about that in Sunday school this morning, that, that our job as believers is to share the gospel. That's your job. And folks ask all the time, well, what's my job? What's my purpose as a believer? To share the gospel. What's the mission God has for my life? To share the gospel. To tell people about Jesus over anything else. And that rides right into verse 14, which picks up the second half of James chapter 2, which says this. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can his faith save him? So we're going to pause right here before we continue in that. What we're talking about here are people that have accepted Christ and aren't on their deathbed. Because some people will look at this and go, well, someone who gets saved right before they pass away, then that means they didn't have work. So, so what's, the, what's this mean for them? It's not what we're talking about here. What they're talking about, what this writing is about, are those that have accepted Christ and are continuing to live their lives exactly as they were before Jesus not doing anything different. No fruit, as it would be said. That they say they're Christians, but in the words of Tom Cade, the evidence would not hold up in a court of law. Right? I've heard someone say it this way before. You may call yourself a Christian, but that's like me standing in a garage and calling myself a Ferrari. There's no evidence that I am, and there's no proof otherwise. Verse 15, if a brother or sister is without clothes and lacks daily food and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and eat well, but you don't give them what the body needs, what good is it? Right. What's the modern version of this? 
right? Someone needs a meal or they need a jacket and you have it, you have extra food, you have an extra jacket, but instead of offering it up, what do we give them? I'll pray for you. Right? That's the modern equivalent. And then, and then, and I've been guilty. I'm speaking to myself here, church. I've been just as guilty of this as any of us, right? That I'll pray for you. And then what do we not do? We don't pray for them right then. Right? If you tell somebody you're going to pray for them, do it then and now in the moment. And so we see 17 in the same way. Faith, if it doesn't have works, is dead by itself. What is it telling us here? That faith in Christ, true faith in Christ, produces works. Right? It's not that when we get saved, all of a sudden somebody's going to go, Oh, I see you just accepted Jesus. We have enrolled you in the children's ministry side of serving. Right? That's not what happens. What happens is, is that when we are saved, truly saved, works are a part of that. Because you're so full of gospel, you're so full of Jesus, you can't help but speak it to people. You can't help but be about wanting to do the work of the gospel. Faith is what saves us. Works is the byproduct of that salvation experience so that people can see what Jesus has done in your life. Right? Because when someone comes to you and goes, why are you so passionate about telling people about this Jesus person? That's when we get to around because he saved me, right? Because he changed me, because he dwells within me and makes me better than I could ever hope to be. That's what this is about. Verse 18, but someone will say, if you have faith and I have works, show me your faith without works and I will show you faith from my works. 19, if you believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe and they shudder. And so what we're being told here is that it's not one or the other. It's one leading to the other. Our faith leads to the works that we do to serve God. Because as it said here, the demons, they know who Jesus is and they believe in him. But they don't do the good work. In the same way we hear people say all the time, oh, you know, I'm, I, I go to church. Right? Oh, I walked down and I said a prayer. Works and life change are those things that show that true acceptance of Jesus has happened. 20. Foolish man, are you willing to learn that faith without works is useless? Right? I think about those people again as you know, sitting in the garage doesn't make you a Ferrari. But in the same way, I think about those that have Jesus and you don't do anything with it. It's like having that beautiful supercar sitting in your garage and never doing what? Never driving it. Never taking it anywhere. Right? We're, we're in sports season, right? NASCAR's going on. It's like having the world's best car for NASCAR and never taking it out of the garage. Right? Sitting there going, oh, it'll beat anybody. It'll, it'll win every race. But you never take it out. Right? It's like having that nice boat sitting in your driveway, but never what? Never putting it on the water. What's the point? What's the point of having an all-encompassing Savior who offered Himself for you if you're not going to do anything with it? If you're not going to be what He's told you to be? 21, wasn't Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? You see that faith was active together with his works and by works, faith was perfected. Our faith is increased and perfected in the works that we do because it's where we see God show up. Because in our works is where God shows up in our weakness because God calls us to the things that we don't feel gifted in as people because we know that when God calls us to things we aren't gifted in, it's because He shows up and provides the gift. And so that when someone was to ask, well, well, how'd you get so good at this, God? How'd you get the ability to do this, Jesus? You know, where did this come from, God? That it would all go back to him. 
23. So the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him for righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. Those of us that have opportunity to do works should be about the gospel. And I know that as we get older, some people sit here and go, well, I, I can't physically do the work anymore. Prayer. Sharing the gospel. Being the hands and feet of Jesus in any way you can. Right? It's not all about hauling bottles of water or moving chairs or tables. Right? There's a, an old book that was, you know, it was kind of a book about Christian ease. Right? Different things that churches say. Crazy stuff that churches say. And, and one of the statements in it was, uh, you have a servant's heart. And they said, that's church speak for go move some chairs. Right? Like go move some stuff. It's not just that, though. It's not. Right? Prayer. Sharing a meal. Being a, a, a sounding board for someone to listen to. Being someone that could be that person that people come to when they're in need. And, and maybe you don't have the thing they need, but you know how to help them find the one who does. Being a facilitator of those things. 25, and in the same way, wasn't Rahab the prostitute also justified by works when, we were she, when she received the messengers and sent them out by a different route? For just as the body without spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. Folks, for, us that are, for those that are believers here today, for those of us that are true believers in Christ today, we're called to something. You have a purpose. You have a mission. You have a calling from God. I can't force you to do it. I can encourage you. I can support you. I will get behind you and push if I have to. I can't make you. I can't force you to do what it is God calling you to do. But I can tell you this. When you do it, He's never going to leave you alone. You're never going to walk through it by yourself. You're never going to be in a situation where you're truly alone because we know in all these situations that we see in the Old Testament, God was with these people. And He tells us that He'll never leave us. And so my challenge to you today, number one, is if you are not saved, then absolutely you need that. Right? You can't get to the works of the gospel without the faith part. You've got to have the faith. You've got to have the belief in Jesus first. But if you're here today and you have the belief, but you refuse to do the work. I cannot encourage you more sternly to do the work. Do the work. It'll make you better. Let us pray. God, we thank you today. God, we pray. We pray that we would do the work. God, that we would do the things you have called us to do, that we would be your people, that we would be your hands and feet. God, I pray for those in here that may not have yet accepted you, that today maybe they would step out and begin that relationship of faith that leads to these works that show your goodness and your mercy and your power and all the fruit that you provide for us. God, I pray whatever it is you've put on the hearts and minds in this room, that people would be receptive to that, not only receptive, but would rejoice in what it is you've given them and that we would all go and do as you have called us to do. It's in your name we pray.